Hello, I am Karen Morn, and News24 is doing this interview live from the Hotel Capital on Park, where the Judicial Service Commission has just ended day two of its interviews for the Chief Justice of the country. Of course, a much anticipated interview today with the only woman to ever be nominated for the Chief Justice position. Supreme Court of Appeal Judge President Mandisa Maya was interviewed today. And I have to say, Jeanette Shabalala, of course, my News24 colleague, mm -hmm. that she really is now the candidate to beat. I mean, what were your impressions of the interview that she gave today? Definitely, Karen. Like, when she walked in, I was like, yes, women power, you know what I mean? And I love the way she uh, presented herself, and she was just so confident, and I was just so excited that finally we have a female nominee, you know, for the next Chief Justice position. So I am just, you know, happy that we got to witness this today. And I think you mentioned it to me before, that one of the big impressive points with her was that she came out and said, when she started speaking about what she'd done at the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2017, those list of the four yeah. things that she wanted to achieve, and then she proceeded to basically detail what she'd been able to do. That was actually clever, because imagine now you come in, they ask you, okay, so you want to become the next Chief Justice, so what, are you, what is your vision for, for uh, the next Chief Justice job? And she was like, you know what, actually, uh, in 2017, when you interviewed me for uh, the president of the SCA, this is what I said I want to do, which is uh, gender parity and lack of congeniality uh, in, in, yes, yes, in the court. And then also, I, I told you that I want more junior judges to get more work. And I've done all those things. Things are going well in the court. And I'm happy to say that, yeah, uh, I've uh, delivered on my promises. And but know. do you think that Mandisa Maya got a bit of an easier ride than Mbuyi Seli Madlanga did? Because, I mean, what, what can we say were the kind of toughest questions that she faced. I mean, you've mentioned that it was sweet. You know, sweet her heart, yeah. Yeah, her, her interview was sweet, but I don't really uh, feel like it was a sweet at interview because she came prepared. I mean, with that, uh, with the address, with her address, what else were you going to say to her with her address? But also, I mean, what was interesting was that when it came up about the John Clope issue, which I think was one of the biggest... Yeah, I was going to ask you about yeah, that. I yeah. mean, I think that she handled that quite well. Mm. Um, that was one of the biggest controversies that I saw her potentially facing. Of course, she was decided to recuse herself yeah. um, when the JSC deliberated on the tribunal report which ultimately found that Judge President John Clope was guilty mm. of uh, gross misconduct for attempting to sway two constitutional court judges in, in 2008 to rule in favour mm. of the then, President Jacob's, uh, then ANC President Jacob Zuma. Yeah. She effectively recused herself from that issue and of course we know that you know in litigation challenging yeah. the tribunal process he is raising her absence as a grounds to mm -hmm. say that the entire process was irregular she today revealed that she in fact regarded mm -hmm. john clope as being a big brother to her that when she had acted in the western cape high court mm -hmm. she had come under attack her and another judge for their appointments he had come out to defend her when she had been overwhelmed working in the Western Cape High Court, he'd been massively supportive of her yeah. and very unafraid, actually, to come forward and say, look, you know, this is someone that I have a relationship yep. with. I, like I didn't that. feel. Mm. And she and I think it was important because otherwise, if she hadn't done that, mm. you know, this issue of her absence in the Clawpe process may well have been used against her. But did you feel that she dealt, I mean, I think that she, I think that she dealt with that adequately. I mean, what's your perception yeah, of it? Definitely she did. It's important to be honest in this uh, position. It's it, like important. With Klope, I know that he's very controversial now, but it's important to actually tell the commissioners that this is my position and uh, this, this is why, I did yeah, I this did. is why I did what I did. So that even when they, you know, they give the, uh, the president a report, they give him an honest report telling him that this is actually an honest candidate you know so karen i also just wanted to find out how do you feel about the judiciary not having a sexual harassment policy yes. i found that very very odd you know this is a big thing that she raised again and again because she was talking in in, in a very broad way about the fact that the legal profession itself mm -hmm. is is not an environment that actively encourages growth and and you know supports women in terms of becoming for instance commercial law experts yeah. 
But she also raised the fact that she was shocked and dismayed to discover that currently, as it stands, there's no sexual harassment policy in terms of the judiciary. And she spoke in non-specific terms about women coming forward and really not having their complaints dealt with mm. in any kind of appropriate way, that they were framed as misconduct matters mm. rather than actually as sexual harassment, stressing the need um, for there to be a sexual harassment policy in within the judiciary and saying that, you know, if appointed and even if not appointed, she is going to push for that. Mm. But I mean it's it's remarkable in, you know, given that the incredible importance of the judiciary in dealing with issues like sexual harassment, that in fact, you know, that currently as it stands, no such policy exists. Mm -hmm. And then I think you also the issue with that's, yeah, that's not yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's not only the, uh, the the only challenge. I mean, not having sexual harassment policy. She was the first woman to actually fall pregnant on the bench. On the bench, In and her they didn't. Uh, yeah, and they didn't know what to do with her. Quote unquote, they yeah. didn't know what to do with me. Exactly. And I mean, so. that talks about an environment that is fundamentally not about enabling women to thrive in it. But what are we saying about judges? Are they not human beings? You know, do they not experience the same things that the society experiences? They are human beings. They're just not women. Well, that doesn't seem well, to be that. <laughs> that doesn't okay. seem. That seems to be the underlying logic. Yeah, mm. is that this environment is not mm. supportive of making it easy for women, mm. particularly in their thirties, mm. um, to enter into this environment and to thrive. And mm. I think she's made it very clear that she wants to deal with it. I mean, what did? How did you react? Um, you know, Commissioner Lucas saying to her, you know, this women of South Africa are behind you. Oh, and and then she actually down. broke down. I mean, how did you feel when that, that happened? That for me, that for me, I was like, wow, actually true. Women of South Africa are very proud of her. I mean, even the question about are we ready for a female uh, chief justice? I mean, that shouldn't even be a question. And she pointed that out. Yeah. She said that, you know, the question itself was problematic. It is. You know, why should she have to ask answer yeah. that? It's like, are you ready for like they a keep human checking are, are you ready to to actually be elevated you know like so there's something there's an underlying and i also was glad glennis britton breitenbach brought this up you mm. know because julius malema yesterday um put it to mbuyu seli madlanga that maybe you should step you know step aside so a woman yeah. can take the position and breitenbach pointing out that that's actually fundamentally patronizing because it implies that Unless a man steps aside for a woman, a woman is not going to get that job. But why was it difficult for him to actually say, yes, definitely, we are ready for a female? Yeah, I think that was a fundamental mistake yeah. in terms of he how he should have just said it. He did the interview. Yeah. Um, and, you know, absolutely could have actually just said at that point, yes, I believe that, you know, that this is the appropriate time for yeah. a woman to, to lead South Africa's courts. So now we're waiting for uh, Dustin Mlambo and then Deputy. Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, right? And we know and those interview interviews yeah. are going to be incredibly incendiary, given yeah. that we've seen these little cookie crumb trails being laid in both these interviews mm. about the questions that specifically people like Julius Malema is going to, to put to mm. um, Zondo, I think, in specifics. But I mean, Mlambo is the next one in that position. Mm. And I think that we are going to see some very, um, you know, strong questioning about the fact that you know, certainly from a political point of view, that Pretoria High Court, the Gauteng High Court in Pretoria has come under considerable, often completely unjustified attack yeah. because of the kind of rulings that it gives, which often, you know, in many instances mm -hmm. have been pivotal to ensuring, for example, that there was in fact a state capture inquiry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Lambo was the judge that ultimately dismissed yep. the then President Jacob Zuma's uh, bid to block the release mm -hmm. of the um, state capture report and to review Tuli Madancela's mm. remedial it's action. Going to be interesting. That, you know, he couldn't <laughs> yeah, um, choose the judge who, who would preside over mm. the, the state capture inquiry. But before we wrap up, Karen, I want to talk about the SEA's top six. That conversation. So the SEA now is running smoothly, right? Yes. I think the Concord is like, like actually envies uh, the SEA. For efficiency, you know, absolutely. Exactly, for efficiency. So, but there was the top six. We don't know who the top six was. What did she say she did? Uh, well, this was an issue that I think was used repeatedly during the JSC um, interviews to undermine the SEA, mm -hmm. long after that this, the fact that this was actually an issue. The top six was essentially a group of judges that were regarded as being not collegial to their younger colleagues, um, patronizing, rude about certain judgments. 
Um, and, you know, basically what had happened was when Maya went into that court, she said it wasn't necessarily accompanied with racial elements, yeah. but that there were substa substantial racial divisions within that court, that judges were not s sitting together in mm -hmm. the tea room, that there was a great deal of kind of underlying um, potentially racial tensions yeah. in that environment. She brought in sensitivity training expert to talk to the judges. There was an open and frank discussion, for example, about this issue of collegiality with the judgments to try and say, look, you know, we can disagree with each other, but it is not appropriate to put down younger judges yeah. about the quality of their judgments, you know, and be dismissive, make them feel small, when in fact it's far better to do mentoring, to, to develop skills, to enable people mm -hmm. to feel that they can come to all the judges and say, look, can you assist me? Yeah. And I think she's done a lot of really great work in terms of taking judges on when they are rude and dismissive of younger colleagues. Yeah. Certainly, uh, Gola Petze, who is the deputy president of the SEA, saying that she had been very effective in taking on people when, when there were those kind of issues, that she had addressed them. Um, and she's not someone in that environment who was afraid of actually taking on you know, divisions and issues within the court. And Jeanette, when you think about it, when we see the kind of deep division that emerged mm -hmm. in the Zuma contempt judgment between Liana Tehran and Sissi Kampepe, where, you know, there were the accusations from Tehran that the, the court, the majority of the court had actually acted unconstitutionally. There was very strong language in that ruling. And, um, you know, Mandisa Zamaya's ability to walk into that environment and be a unifier mm. may in fact be exactly what the Apex Court needs. But also she mentioned that uh, it wasn't easy with yeah. the top six. It wasn't easy. So no, it took a lot I, of conversation. Yeah. And also I remember what Matopo said, Justice Matopo, he's now with the Constitutional yes. Court. What he said was that um, when she joined, uh, she introduced uh, sensitivity training, obviously. However, the top six didn't really it was like preaching to the choir they did they were not really open to the idea of you know being collegial so it wasn't easy no and i think the thing is is that what we have seen with maya is that she's not afraid of confrontation mm -hmm. but she has a very clever and careful and measured way of dealing with it mm -hmm. and i think that she may well be the person mm -hmm. you know certainly based on this interview even though she did get a lot less of a rough ride mm -hmm. than for instance mbuyiseli matlanga did that she may be the right person to, to bring unity, but also to draw a very hard line in the sand um, in terms of the kind of attacks and, mm -hmm. and issues that the judiciary has faced. Unfortunately, as a consequence of the fact that she wasn't necessarily put those tough questions about the attacks on yeah. the judiciary, the legitimacy of the judiciary, the kind of things um, that, the, you know, for instance, Raymond Zondel was asked to j address in terms of Ndiwe Sisulu's remarks about mm -hmm. so-called house Negro judges. Yeah. Unfortunately, because she wasn't given those opportunities, I think she was denied the opportunity to come out and make the strong statements that one would hope she would make and that I'm sure she would make if those issues are put to her. But thank you, Jeanette. It has been amazing speaking to you and we will continue as News24 to bring you live up-to-date coverage on the Chief Justice interviews and to really try and bring you the insights that enable you to get a best, the best possible sense of these excellent candidates that have been put forward to lead South Africa's courts. Every single one of these justices bring a huge amount of ability, aptitude, competence, strength and courage. Um, and of course, the two judges that have really been most firmly in the firing line in terms of defending the judiciary, both um, Raymond Zondor and uh, Dunstan and Lambo tomorrow are going to be in the hot seat over the next two days. News 24 will be bringing you live coverage of those interviews um, and hopefully enabling you to make the most measured decision about who the best choice as South Africa's next Chief Justice actually is.